Thank you, and welcome to Dotco. So two years ago, I stood on a stage like this, and I told you about my opinion for how configuration options should be managed in Go. And the cornerstone of this presentation started as a blog post by Rob Pike. It's called Self-Referential Functions and the Design of Options. And in the last two years, it's been truly wonderful to watch this idea mature from Rob's blog post all the way to the GRPC PC project, who've really continued to evolve this design pattern into what I think is its best form so far. But when I was talking to some gophers in London at a conference a few months ago, several of them expressed a concern that while they understood the idea of a function which returns a function, and this is the technique that powers functional options, they were worried that other Go programmers, and I, I suspect they mean less experienced Go programmers, wouldn't be able to understand this style. And this made me a little bit sad because I consider Go support of first-class functions to really be a gift. And it's something that we should all be able to take advantage of. So I'm, gonna, I'm here today to show you that you don't need to fear first-class functions. So to begin with, we'll really quickly recap the functional option pattern. We start with some options expressed as a function which takes a pointer to a structure to configure. We pass these functions to a constructor, and inside the body of that constructor, we iterate over each function in order, passing in a reference to the config. And finally, we call new terrain with the options that we want. And away we go. So hopefully everyone is familiar with this pattern. Now where I believe the confusion comes from is when you need to have an option function which takes an argument. So for example, we have with cities, which lets us add a number of cities to our terrain model. Because with cities takes an argument, we can't simply pass with cities to new terrain. Like the signatures just don't match. Instead, we evaluate with cities, passing the number of cities to create and use the result of this function as the value to pass to new terrain. So what's going on here? Let's, break, let's just break it down. Fundamentally, evaluating a function returns a value. We have functions that take two numbers and return a number. We have functions that take a slice and return a pointer some structure. And now, we have a function which returns a function. And the type of the value that is returned from with cities in this example is a function which takes a pointer to config. And it's this ability to treat functions as regular values that leads to the name, a first class function. So another way to think about what's going on here is if we try to rewrite the functional option pattern using an interface. So rather than using a function type, we just declare an interface, we'll call it option, and give it a single method, apply, which takes a pointer to config. Whenever we need to call new terrain, we, and we pass in one or more values that implement our options interface. And inside new terrain, just as before, we iterate over each of those values and call the apply method on each of them. All right. So this doesn't look too different to what we saw in the previous example. Rather than ranging over a slice of functions, we range over a slice of interface values and call a method on them. So let's take a look at the other side. What does it look like when you need to declare an option? Because we're passing around interface implementations, we need to declare a type to hold that apply method. We also need to declare a constructor to return our splines option implementation. And hopefully, you've already picked up that this is more code. Now, to write with cities using our option interface, we need to do a little bit more work. In the previous functional version, the value of n, the number of cities we want to create, was captured lexically for us in the declaration of that anonymous function. Because we're using an interface, 
we need to declare a type to hold the count of cities. And we need it then a constructor to make sure it's properly assigned. And then putting it all together, we call new terrain with the result of evaluating with reticulated splines and with cities. Now at GopherCon last year, Thomas Sennart spoke about this duality of a first-class function and an interface with just one method. And you can see it play out in this example. The interface with one method and the function are to some extent equivalent. But as you can see, dealing with functions as first-class citizens is much less code. So let's leave interfaces for a moment and talk about some other properties of first-class functions. When we invoke a function or a method, we do so by passing around data. The job of that function is often to interpret that data and take some action. Function values allow you to pass behavior to be executed rather than data to be interpreted. And in effect, passing a function value allows you to declare code that will execute later, perhaps in a different context. And to illustrate this, let's look at an example. Here's a simple calculator. It has a set of operations it understands, and it has one method called do. And do takes an operation and an operand. Also for convenience, do returns the value of the accumulator after the operation is applied. Now, our calculator only knows how to add, subtract, and multiply. If we wanted to implement division, we'd have to allocate an, oper an operation constant, then we'd have to open up the do method, and we'd have to add the code that actually implements division. And this sounds kind of reasonable, like it's only a few lines of code, but what about when you want to implement square root, or exponentiation, or any other function that a calculator handles? Every time we did this, do is gonna get bigger, because, and it's going to become harder to follow. Because each time we add an operation, we also have to encode into do the knowledge of how to interpret that operation. So let's rewrite our calculator. As before, we have a calculator which manages its own accumulator. The calculator has a do method, but this time the operation is a function and it takes a value as the operand to work on. Now, this signature of the operation function might be a little bit intimidating, so I've broken it out into its own declaration. So let's talk quickly about what that declaration is. The opfunct type, as you see there, is a function which takes two floats and returns a third. Whenever do is called, it calls the operation function that we pass in, providing its own accumulator and an operand that we provide. Okay. So how are we going to use this new calculator? As you've probably figured out, we use it by writing operations as functions. So this is the code to add. Uh, what about if we wanted to do the other operations? Subtract, multiply, they're not very hard to do either. And as before, we construct a calculator and then call it, passing operations to apply and an operand. All right. So now we can describe operations as functions. We can probably go ahead and extend our calculator now to handle things like square root. But it turns out that there's a problem. Square root only takes one argument, not two. But the signature of our calculator's do method requires an operation function that has two, two arguments. So what can we do about this? I mean, maybe we can just cheat and just say, and just ignore the operation. That's kind of a bit gross. I think, I think we can do a bit better. So let's redefine add from a function that's called with two values and returns a third to a function which returns a function that takes one value and returns one value. So our do method now invokes the operation function passed into it, and it provides its own accumulator, and then stores the result of evaluating that function back in the accumulator. Now in main, we call calc.do not with the add function itself, but with the result of evaluating add of 10. 
and the type of evaluating out of 10 is a function which takes a value and returns us a value. And this matches the signature that do requires. So subtraction and multiplication are easy to implement, as before. But what about square root? It turns out that that's now easy as well. This implement of square root, implementation of square root avoids the awkward syntax of the previous calculator's operation function, as our calculator now operates on functions which take and return just one value. And I hope that you've noticed that the signature of square root and the signature of main.square root are the same. So now we can, so we can make this code smaller by reusing any function from the math package that just takes a single argument. So what's happened here? We started with a model of hard-coded interpreted logic. We moved to a functional model where we pass in the behavior that we want. And then by evolving this a step further, we've generalized our calculator to work for operations regardless of the number of arguments they take. So let's change tracks a little bit and talk about what most of us are here at a Go conference for. Concurrency, and specifically actors. And to give due credit, the examples here are inspired by a talk by Brian Borham from Golang UK a couple of months ago. You really should check that one out. So suppose we're building a chat server. We plan to be the next hip chat or the next Slack. But we probably we should start small for the moment. Here's the first cut of the heart of any chat system. We have a way to register new connections. We have a way to remove old connections. And we have a way to send, uh, to send messages to all of the registered connections. Now, because this, uh, this is a server, and all of these methods could be called concurrently, we need to make sure that we use a mutex or something to protect this cons map to make sure there are no data races and it's not corrupted. So, is, is this what we call idiomatic Go? Maybe. This is our first proverb. Don't mediate access to shared, shared memory with locks and mutexes. Instead, share that memory by communicating. So let's apply this advice to our chat server. Rather than using mutex to serialize access to this cons map, we can give that job to a Go routine and communicate with that Go routine via some channels. So add sends the connection to add on the add channel. Remove sends the address of a connection to remove on the remove channel. And send message sends the message to be transmitted to each connection via the send message channel. And so now let's look at loop. Rather than using a mutex to serialize access to the cons map, loop will wait until it receives an operation in the form of a value sent over one of these channels, and it will apply the relevant case. And we don't need the mutex anymore because the shared state, this cons map, is now local to the loop function. It can't be mutated by anybody else. There cannot be a race because it only exists within the scope of that function. But there's still a lot of hard-coded logic in here. Loop only knows how to do three things. It only knows how to add, remove, and send messages. And as with the previous calculator example, if we wanted to extend our marks, it would involve adding a channel, adding a helper to send data over that channel, and then opening up the select logic inside loop and adding the knowledge of how to process that data. So let's look at our, let's look at our calculator. So just like our calculator example, we can rewrite our MUX to use first-class functions to pass around the behavior we want to be executed, not the data to interpret. Now each method sends an operation to be ex executed in the context of the loop function using a single operation channel. In this case, the signature of the operation function is a map of addresses to cons. Probably in a real program, you're going to have a more complicated type to represent clients, but 
For the purposes of this example, I think this is sufficient. Remove is similar. We send a function that deletes the connection's address from the map supplied. And send message is a function which iterates over all the connections in the supplied map and calls write string to send each of them a copy of the message. So now you can see that we've moved the logic from the body of loop into anonymous functions which are created by our helpers. And so now the job of loop is simply to create this connections map and then wait in a loop for operations to come in and then execute them one at a time. But there are a few little problems to fix. The most pressing is the lack of error handling inside send message. I mean, if there's an error writing to one of the connections, that's just going to be discarded. So let's, let's take a look at how to fix that now. To handle the error generated inside, an anon we, inside the anonymous function that we pass into loop, we need to create a channel to communicate the result of the operation. This also creates a point of synchronization. The last line of send message blocks until the function we passed into loop has been completed. And note that we didn't have to change the body of loop at all to incorporate this. We didn't have to change anything about the existing code. And this means that we can now go ahead and add new functionality, like the ability to send a private message to one channel, to one client. And we do this by passing in a function to loop that tries to find the, uh, find the client that matches this address. And then we wait for the result to be transmitted back. We check to see if it's nil, which is an indication that that client is no longer connected. Otherwise, we now have the connection and we can write our message to the client. So in summary, first class functions bring us tremendous expressive power. They let you pass around behavior, not just dead data to be interpreted. Now first class functions aren't new or novel. Many older languages have offered them, even C. In fact, it was only somewhere along the lines of removing pointers from object-oriented languages that somehow we lost this ability. And really, if you're a JavaScript program, you've probably sat there in the audience wondering what I'm talking about for the last 15 minutes. This is like second nature to you. First-class functions, like other features Go offers, should be used with restraint. Just like it's possible to make a, an overcomplicated program by the overuse of channels, it's just as easy to make an incomprehensible program with the overuse of first-class functions. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them, just use them in moderation. And first-class first functions are something I believe every Go programmer should have in their toolbox. First-class functions aren't unique to Go, and it's so and something Go programmers should not be afraid of using. And if you can learn to use interfaces, you can learn to use a first-class function. They aren't hard, they're just a little bit unfamiliar. And this unfamiliarity is something that I believe that can be overcome with time and experience. So next time you define an API that has just one method, I want you to ask yourself, should this really just be a function? Thank you so much. <laughs>